In this video, I'm going to show you how to compose strings that sound like this. Okay, so if you recognized it, this was not an original piece of mine. This is Eno Cordova's theme composed by Stephen Barton for the video game Jedi Fallen Order. If I screwed up the credits there, I will put the correct text on screen. But yeah, just to reiterate, this is not my composition. Um, this is from Star Wars uh, video game. And the reason I want to break this down is because it's an example of something which is actually used in Hollywood um, in a video game. And so I think... For that reason, it's gonna be a great thing to look at because this is an example of something that actually got used. Um, so in today's video, I wanna sort of go over all of the little things that come together in your DAW or on your computer to get this type of sound. Um, starting from composition, looking a little bit at chord voicings and talking about different modes and then talking a little bit also about mixing and production and sample libraries, mic positions, just a bunch of little things that I think come together to make this sound. There is no one big secret to getting Hollywood sounding epic strings. There's sort of a lot of little things that come together as is the case with music in general, right? There's never one big secret. <laughs> um, so yeah, without uh anything else to say Let, let's let's break this down so the let me i'm just gonna i've got this um being played by an ensemble patch um so we're just gonna look at the midi for all of the strings right now um if you're not familiar with an ensemble patch certain sample libraries offer patches that aren't just the first violins or the cellos but uh are the whole string section recorded all at once which really gives a sense of continuity um and glue that you can't quite get when you're just recording the individual sections. Obviously, you want to have articulations with the individual sections. You don't want to only have ensembles because you need that level of detail. But when it comes to getting this sort of epic Hollywood sound that really is going to be just flowing chords with some counterpoint, starting with ensembles is going to be the place to go. So this piece was originally written in D, I believe. I have transposed it to try and avoid getting the piece taken down off of YouTube. So hopefully I can still upload this. Um, I've moved it down to C, but the original piece is in D. Um, so that's going to be tip number one. Um, there's going to be a lot of tips in this video, which is that if you're looking for a key to start writing in when you want that sort of epic Hollywood sound, write in D. Um, it's the most commonly used key for the modern Hollywood sound. It works great because uh, for, for a lot of different reasons, but because of the, I would say, I mean, there's going to be a lot of modal mixture in Hollywood, but the real frequency with which the Dorian mode is used and the nature of the fact that D is D Dorian um, on top of uh, just where voicings land, it's a really, really common place to start. So yeah, write your pieces in D, tip number one. Um, so this piece is going to be functioning in, it's in 3-2, you can think of it as 3-2, 3-4, just doesn't really matter. Um, but it does give this a little bit of um, syncopation. So instead of just having chords that are one bar, one bar, one bar, one bar. So this piece is going to be in 3-2, um, which is not the most commonly found meter. You're going to see 3-4 more often. They're effectively the same. It's just sort of slowing things down so as to keep the BPM at a reasonable um, number at 70. Um, this could also be in 3-4 at a 35 BPM. Um, you could kind of think of it either way. But as we look at the, the MIDI here and break down the composition itself, um, let's look at just the, the first thing to look at is the chord rhythm. So instead of just having evenly balanced chords where we've got a chord, if like if we were in 4-4 four, four, where we've got a chord held down for a whole bar and then a whole bar and we just keep rotating, there's something very just interesting rhythmically here going on and the fact that things aren't particularly even. Now they're consistent in the fact that we go from half note to whole note, from half note to whole note, and that makes up our sort of 
four bar or in the case of it being in three, two, two bar um, segment that repeats. But um, there's, so there's consistency here, but there's a little bit of an interesting rhythm going on. Anyways, I don't want to get, <laughs> get bogged down by a bunch of different details, but let's talk about harmony. Let me arm my track, which it is perfect. Um, so we're starting in minor. Um, and we've got this chord progression, which is going to be very common, which is going to be minor one, down to the flat six, which is going to be major, then to the flat seven, which is also going to be major, and then we go to the major four, which is not found in minor, sounds like this. So in C, this is going from C minor to A flat major to B flat major to F major. So one thing to notice right off the bat is that a lot of these Hollywood sounds start in minor, but make use of a lot of major chords. This triumphantness that we associate with this type of music makes use of a ton of major chords that tend to be found in a non just sort of basic cheesy major key. Um, so what I want to talk about and focus on is the use of the Dorian mode and sort of modal mixture because if we're in C minor, right, we've got the notes C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C. Um, that's C minor. What makes Dorian Dorian is that the, um, the flat six is naturalized. So what this does is it removes our flat six chord. The major flat six goes away and it gets replaced with this major four chord. So you get this Hollywood sound, which is very common, which is gonna be this flipping back and forth between a minor one and a major four. There's a lot of Hollywood in that. And because of the fact that we are going outside of minor. Now, if this were piece were to be strictly written in Dorian, however, and just be in D Dorian, or as I've got it transposed, C Dorian, we wouldn't see any of the A flats, but we do. I mean, we see an A flat right here. Um, I know this is labeled as G sharp, but just read everything for now as flats. Um, Daws like to default to sharp. Um, so we've got this A flat here, um, and we've got other A flats that appear in the piece. So there is this, what we refer to as sort of maybe like modal mixture. Um, where we're moving back and forth between minor and Dorian without really thinking twice about it. Um, so this is going to be something that I would encourage you to play around with and also pay attention to in your score studies is how frequently something that um, is sort of epic and triumphant and has that epic Hollywood string sound that you're looking for is making use of modal mixture. But if you were to learn one, because I know that there's a, it's really overwhelming to try and pay attention to all the different modes and how do I combine them, this flipping back and forth between minor and Dorian, just making use of both the A flat and the A natural is going to be something which is going to give you a real Hollywood sound. So let me just play this if it were F minor. So this would be strictly speaking staying in C minor. So let's listen to what this sounds like. Now, that sounds wrong, partly because I've listened to this so many times and you just heard it. So it actually almost sounded like we <laughs> went to the wrong key, but that would be what it would sound like if we stuck strictly in minor. But because of the fact that our ear is so almost trained to hear the Dorian mode, this transition sounds super, super natural. Now there are other things we can do to set ourselves up to make this transition sound even more natural, but it's going to sound really natural in part because of how uh, used to the ear is to hearing this back and forth between minor, minor one, and major four. Um, I just heard some cracks and popples, cracks and popples, cracks and pops. Um, the record, recording and playing the sample uh, is causing some cracks and pops, so I apologize for that. That's uh, not anyone else's audio, that's mine. Um, so yeah, this is this is going to be the first four bars. Is going from minor one to major six to major seven to major four. So this starting off with some sort of chord progression and with a really simple melody that hovers around the tonic 
is going to be a great way to set yourself up for this slow moving epic Hollywood sound. We don't necessarily want a melody which is going to be soaring up all over the place and doing all sorts of crazy, you know, stuff all over the place. We can get there eventually, as you see, we grow here in a moment. But for these sort of slow moving epic building parts, um, keeping the melody very stable and moving some of the counterpoint around it is going to help you achieve that sound. So whilst we've got root fifth, root fifth, root fifth down to down to um, the root in octaves and then with the fifth up here, we've got very simple moving bass line here. What's giving this its life and its emotion is really the counterpoint. If I mute everything but the melody, we can listen to what the melody sounds like. It's really not anything too crazy, right? So it's memorable, um, and it's also very repetitive in the fact that we look at the look at this rhythmic consistency. Starting here, um, let me get it down to quarter or yeah, we'll leave it at eighth notes. It's going from quarter note to two eighth notes, and then once again, once we reach bar two, this is the same, just being played by different notes, but the rhythmic consistency is there. Um, so. What's giving this piece its life, however, is going to be the counterpoint going on in the middle. So let me let me just play. I've got the melody here. Let me play it with the bass line. And we can hear this might be something that sounds pretty similar to where you're getting when you're trying to get out of that beginner phase into a sort of a more intermediate string writing um, where you've got a bass line. You're making use of modal mixture and you've got a melody on top of it. Now, this is where a lot of people get stuck. This is where I get really, really stuck a lot of the time. I'm not trying to say I'm as good as Stephen Barton. But um, let's take a listen to this because I think the, the step getting from this to the next step is where things get really interesting and things start to sound really professional and musical. Um, so let's just listen to this, the melody and the bass line. So that's great. Um, it's a great starting point, but it's not, it, this wouldn't, if you were scoring a big blockbuster or, you know, a big blockbuster film or, or a big Star Wars video game or something, something like this isn't quite going to cut it. What gives the epicness to these, these string passages is going to be the counterpoint. And a lot of the time this is going on underneath the melody and between the bass line. Um, this is going to be the most common place for you to find it. Um, so let's look at what's going on because writing these counter melodies, writing these counter lines can seem really, really, really challenging. Um, the first thing I want you to pay attention to is just how much of them are chord tones. We've got a C minor here to start. Um, so we've literally this whole section here minus this D in the melody is going to be notes that are in C minor. So we look at the notes that are going to be moving and set us up for this movement in this sort of section right here. We've got this E flat and the G. So those are going to be notes in C minor. Now, we're not starting with a bunch of movement. We're letting the C minor hold out. This is establishing to the listener's ear that this is C minor. And there is a use of a, of a note that's not in C minor, but this is more of a passing tone into the next chord. So using these passing tones towards the end of a held out chord is going to not be nearly as noticeable insofar as the dissonance it creates. Now, playing a C minor with the ninth um, voiced above it is not even going to sound that dissonant as it is, but particularly with this D over here passing into the next chord, um, because of also the stepwise motion from the E flat to the D down to the C, we get a really nice flowing transition into the next chord. So then we've got this A flat major chord, which is going to be held out for a little bit longer. So, and the melody also very strategically is not doing much on this chord. And this is very strategic writing, which is when you're writing your melody, give yourself space for counter lines. Don't have them moving all the time or else you won't have space for an interesting counter line. And you'll be relying on the whole movement and motion of your piece to be taking place in the melody, which is not going to give you nearly the same emotional impact and depth as having interesting counterpoint. So as we move into the A flat major, the major six, which is a very, very common place to go from C minor. And let's just think for a second as far as what's going on here. If you've if you've heard of um, chromatic medians, so we got this idea of going from like C major 
up to E major or C major up to E flat major. This idea of of moving back and forth between thirds, um, you know, starting on, on a note like C and going a third away to like an E natural or an E flat um, and using chords that exist outside of the home key, that chromatic median sound is going to be very, 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 very common in Hollywood. So let me voice it maybe more like this from a C major to an E flat major. Maybe a C major to an E major. Keeping that, keeping one of the notes um, consistent in its voicing, this chromatic median sound is going to be super, super common in Hollywood film music. Now, why is one of the reasons that going starting from your minor one going to a major flat six going to sound so Hollywood right off the bat? Is because this is, although it's not chromatic in the sense that A flat is found in C minor, it still is a median. We are making this Hollywood move of moving a third away. C is the major third of A flat. So even though this isn't chromatic, we're setting ourselves up for maybe future chromatic medians to sound even more Hollywood and sparkly, but we've still got a very Hollywood sound. Sounds super Hollywood. It almost sounds like we've gone somewhere out of the key, uh, which we haven't. But as opposed to if I were to go from C minor to maybe the flat seven. Still a gorgeous sound, but much more sort of, um, it, it's a very different feeling. I don't know quite how to describe it, but I, but I hope you know what I mean. So anyways, that's too, that's too long on that point. Um, so we've gone to this A flat, right? And this E flat here is going to be found in A flat. So is this C. So we're starting right off the bat with only notes found in A flat. And then um, there's this, uh, the counterpoint uh, is introduced here. So let me mute the melody and listen to the counterpoint here. Even maybe mute the bass. So what do we have going on here? I mean, there's some things to think about. And one of the things that when we start learning about counterpoint that we're always focusing on and learning about are things like parallel fifths and octaves and thirds and sixths and how those are going to sound great. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, um, that's something to definitely spend some time learning when it comes to counterpoint. Um, I'm no expert at it, but those are some of the, like the basic things that you're you're introduced to first is this idea of not having parallel octaves, not having parallel fifths, trying to stick to thirds and sixths, that sort of thing. Um, but another thing that I want to talk about that I don't think maybe gets talked about as much and is also just frankly simpler is how frequently in Hollywood writing and scores that I've analyzed of scores that I like, we see repeats of rhythmic, um, identity and, and sort of consistent movement that exists in the melody that's being moved into our counterpoint. This is going to help it flow so, 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 so much. So we've got quarter note, eighth note, eighth note. And then the eighth notes here are descending. What do we have here? You can think of this as quarter note, eighth note, eighth note. And this is the same exact motion as this right here, right? Um, if I mute, uh, you know what I mean. I don't need to mute it. <laughs> um, and then we keep falling. And instead of just holding it out, we fall again for another quarter note. And then as the melody picks up its movement again, we go back to just sustained chords. And then we end the piece um, on a long drawn out sustained chord, which is gonna help empath em empathize emphasize the fact that this F major, um, or if we were in D, the G major, is the key, is the, the chord that I really want you to feel. This is going to give it this real Hollywood sound. Um, but once again, even to transition back into C minor, into the next section, um, we've got this falling eighth note pattern again, which is moving stepwise. Everything here is stepwise. There's so much stepwise motion, another thing to pay attention to. And if you're not familiar with what I mean by stepwise motion, it just means moving up or down the scale. It's C to D is stepwise motion. C to E flat, not technically stepwise motion. Still a small leap, but not stepwise motion. Um, so these moves up and down in stepwise motion 
following a lot of consistent rhythmic movement whilst constantly moving in some way is going to give this piece so much, so much, so much, so much life. So now let me once again, just for the sake of everyone really hearing this, um, I'm going to mute the counterpoint that's going on here and we're going to listen to um, the, the melody and the bass line. Now, with the counterpoint going on, listen, this all of a sudden really sounds like epic Hollywood string writing. It's subtle, but it gives the piece real life and depth. And the melody is being played up here by violins as the counterpoint moves into, I don't remember, uh, who's playing what, but I imagine either violas or, or cellos are playing this. Um, there's this back and forth between the different sections of the strings, and you also have to remember the panning when you're recording a live orchestra. A lot of the time, the cellos and the basses are going to be off to the right, the violins are going to be off to the left. So even though these notes are very close in terms of how far they apart on the keyboard, if the counter line is being played by a section that's different than the violins, first off, it's going to stand out because it's a different instrument. But second off, a lot of the time, the panning is going to give it this real stereo width that when you're listening in headphones and you're listening to scores you really, really like, it almost feels like there's this blur, right? As Like we're constantly moving from like left to right and right to left in our stereo field in our headphones, which gives the piece so much life. And one way to achieve this, of course, is to literally go into your DAW and start drawing in some panning. But another way to achieve this is to smartly write your melody in violins and then have your counter line be played by the cellos, right? Or something like that. It's going to give it this really natural sort of wave that the that the orchestra and the strings are just so, 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 so good at. Um, so that's just the first four bars, right? But we're, or two bars, we're in three, two. Um, but this, I, I, I think, gives you an idea. Now, I realize I've probably been recording at this point for 20 minutes. I had planned on going over this whole... <laughs> this whole piece, which I could do, but then this video would end up being two hours. So I'm not going to do that. Um, what I am going to go through here and point out is just some more instances of modal mixture. Um, so as this piece moves and grows, as it's setting itself up to go into the really big, loud section, um, there's some more just playing around. Um, there's, it's a little bit less stable as it's moving. Um, that's going to be my quick note, is things are a little bit less stable as we're moving and growing. But we also do continue to use modal mixture. So there are going to be an A flat here. Um, let me see if there's any A naturals that appear anywhere nearby. Um, we get them up here. Um, and down here, there's a sort of D minor chord. There's a sort of minor two, which also is a chord that's not going to exist in C minor, right? So the natural, the natural two chord in C minor would be like a D diminished sound because of the A flat. But Dorian gives us a minor two. So, I mean, it's really common when you're playing around with, with Dorian to think of, of course, minor one, major four. But there's also minor one, major or er, minor two. So there are times where if you want to like use a, a Dorian sound, but you don't want it to be a particularly cheerful moment, just something else to consider. I noticed when I was studying this. Also, when he goes to this D minor, pay attention to the use of the major third here. Um, we get the counter line is playing some notes out of C major. So there's this D minor chord, and we get notes being played in... C major, which is really, really beautiful and really interesting. And when I was listening to this, I listened to this section. I was like, yes, this really sounds like Star Wars. So let me play this section. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But um, yeah, we've got some modal mixture here with the A natural. We also have the E natural here. Um, and pay attention to like this chord and what's going on here and how, um, maybe not, or just how Hollywood Star Wars this sounds. <laughs> So 
so then it's it's moving and it's moving and it's setting us up for the big loud section okay i don't have time to go more in detail um like i said but something i thought was cool like this section to me sounds like sad this chord but it's using all notes out of c major uh the major one so just interesting thing to know so my breakdown from the first four bars kind of would continue to apply and maybe i'll make some other videos for making the uh, maybe i'll make another video breaking down this transaction transition section here I'm starting to speak loudly because I'm trying to get through everything. But there's a lot more I wanted to talk about when it comes to epic Hollywood string writing. So that is all I'm going to say for now regarding orchestration and composition. Should have said that in reverse, composition and orchestration. Um, next thing I want to talk about is, again, the concept of a wave. Um, you're going to see that a lot of the time there is going to be wave motion. Um, you're going to be crescendoing and then dim, I can't say this word, diminuendoing <laughs> um, over and over and over again. When it comes to epic Hollywood strings, this is going to be ridiculously common. Um, one thing you're going to hear all the time, right, is, I mean, it might either just be slow moving chords like this, but also an, uh, an ostinato that's moving as these slow moving chords are coming on in a wave. Another thing to play around with because it's also incredibly common and going to give you that epic uh you know goosebump feeling um a lot of the time but let's look at the mod wheel and just sort of up down up down up down and as we're growing we're just growing a little bit and a little bit um so as we're looking at the mod wheel um this is going to give it some some real life and give it that sense of wave um so l let me play a few chords here as you can look at the mod wheel this isn't a huge tip this is i, I think when you're watching youtube tutorials um, you've probably seen this thing before, but just something to point out. And now, um, so that is the, okay. So we've talked about composition, orchestration, and part of the composition of course is going to be your dynamics, which is what the mod wheel is meant to represent. So that was still a point on composition. So that was composition and orchestration. Um, dynamics, key, uh, counterpoint, melody, those sorts of things um, that that goes into this, this string writing sound. So the next thing I want to talk about is going to be the use of sample libraries and microphone positions because this is going to play a just massive, massive difference in your sound. Playing around with mic positions in your sample libraries that you've purchased, like, please do it before you go and buy super, super expensive reverbs. Um, a lot of the time, the sound you're looking for, is, as far as that reverb washed out Hollywood sound, can be found by playing around with the microphone positions. So I want to talk about how to get this sound. So for this piece, I have got a combination of Cinematic Studio Strings Ensemble on top of Spitfire Chamber Strings Ensemble. So What's going on here is we've got a studio string sound, which is going to be a little bit, there's going to be more players than the chamber strings, but not as many players as if it was like a full-blown symphony orchestra. When you layer that with a chamber strings ensemble patch from like this one from Spitfire and this one from Cinematic Studio, the two of them come together to give you a really, really full string section. Um, and so this is like strategic layering for a bunch of different reasons. And so it's the size of the string section, but it's also the the sound and the what we've got available to us with microphone positions so in the cinematic studio strings when you pull up the full ensemble you just have like the basic mix but in spitfire i've got the um like i think what's i don't know exactly what it's called but it's like the core edition um but it's the one that comes with the close microphone the tree and the ambient it's not the full pro edition but it's also not they released one recently that was like a couple hundred bucks this one was the middle one um so part of getting the epic Hollywood sound, I'll just be straight up honest. Like if you do orchestral programming and you do it a lot and you listen to a lot of film music, part of getting the sound, I want to be careful with how I word this because I don't want to like suggest that people need to go buy things, but like certain sample libraries are just going to sound better. Um, that's just the nature of the beast. And there's a reason that a lot of people use cinematic studio strings because it sounds gorgeous. 
And there's a reason that a lot of people layer Cinematic Studio strings with a sample library, which is a little bit drier and maybe smaller. It doesn't necessarily have to be a smaller section, but something drier to give it more clarity. So let's listen to Cinematic Studio strings on its own um, because this is a gorgeous sample library. Maybe if I turn this up a little bit to really hear it. Now this is got no reverb, right? And there's no reverb in the plugin here. Now I've got a little bit of reverb going on in the processing, but you hear how wet that is. This doesn't need a ton of reverb, right? Part of getting that epic Hollywood sound with the reverb on it is using strategic sample libraries. Now I've played around with the attack and release a little bit, but that's more so just getting it to work well with Spitfire's chamber strings. The only thing of note that I would say that's going on here is I've got some panning going on, um, some pretty intense panning. The violin's pretty hard to the left, the celli pretty hard right, um, violin two is a little bit left and bass is a little bit right, viola's right down the middle. Um, that's the reason for that is partially because that tends, some version of that tends to be how they're seated. But if I were just using Cinematic Studio Strings Ensemble on its own, I probably wouldn't do that because things would get a little too wide and a little bit too wonky. The reason I'm doing that is because Cinematic Studio Strings for me in this case is really just giving the room sound. It's effectively functioning as like a really gorgeous sounding reverb to the clarity that comes with Spitfire Chamber Strings um, which is going to be more right down the middle. So I've got a lot of close mic here. And this is, again, when you just load up this patch, it comes with just the tree. So let's just listen to that. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous string library. But listen to how much drier this is compared to Cinematic Studio strings. But once we add in the close, now listen to the depth we get. And I think... So much of, for me over the years of listening to scores, I hear like there's this, you just don't know quite how to describe it, but there's this sound of it being in a room, being in a hall, like a scoring stage or some hall that my ear just hears it. And it hears the beautiful, beautiful reverb tale. It hears the beautiful wash of the room, the reflections. And so my brain, when I come to start programming, is just like, Chris, add more reverb, add more reverb add more reverb. Um, but part of it that I think I have not paid attention to enough until recently is the importance of clarity and the importance of getting some close mic into your ensemble. Now, if I were layering this with a bunch of other stuff, this might be too much. The combination of the really wide panned cinematic studio strings on top of the really, really in depth with a ton of close mic Spitfire chamber strings. But this is meant to be full on its own and to sound beautiful on its own. So anyways, let's listen to what the, the close microphone does just with the chamber strings. And once again with that off. Listen to what this does for the transitions. The there's so much focus on getting really beautiful legato sounds, but listen to what this close mic does for the transitions and how much realism it gives it. And I'm sorry again for the, for the cracking and popping. Um, I don't believe there's much I can do about it um, other than purge things, but then we get to deal with the beauty of that sound for a few minutes. Um, so now when I combine them, when I turn these both on, you get the room sound, the full lush sound of cinematic studio strings on top of the clarity and depth of chamber strings. And the two of them together are just gorgeous. Now, I think the cinematic studio strings really comes out in the tail, in the long held out notes. You really hear the sound of the beautiful, beautiful beautifully mixed, beautifully recorded cinematic studio strings. The panning here, I think, also really begins to come out during those long extended notes. 
Um, but there's no doubt that the clarity and depth that Spitfire Chamber Strings is giving is crucial to getting this epic Hollywood sound. Because once again, Cinematic Studio Strings is like a beautiful library. If you're watching sample library reviews and you're trying to buy your first sam uh, string library, this is part of what gets recommended to people a lot, right? And once again, this has got some panning on it, but on its own, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play this in solo and then I'm gonna add this chamber strings. Listen to how much adding chamber strings does. Now, part of this is also volume. I've got the chamber strings up much louder because this is meant to function kind of, like I said, as a reverb. Um, but let me do let me do the same in reverse now though. Let me start with just the chamber strings and then add a cinematic studio. A little more subtle, but definitely giving it some of that room sound. Um, so yeah, that's my sort of spiel on sample libraries and microphone positions. Um, if you only own one sample library, what I would recommend with is if they come with different microphone positions, um, play around with them and add in some close mic if maybe you've been afraid. If you've always just been using the default mix, play around with the just the tree, the outriggers, and the close and find a balance that sounds good to you because the microphone positions play, play just a massive, massive role in the sound. And as much as the composition and using different fancy schmancy modes and having nice counterpoint um, makes a big, big difference, so does, when it comes to sample libraries, so does the sample library. It makes a huge difference. And combining sample libraries in a strategic way is gonna be a crucial part of getting the epic Hollywood sound. Um, now, the last thing I think to talk about is just going to be the processing. So let me, I've got some very basic processing going on here, but the processing that is happening is pretty standard in from what I've watched of other YouTube tutorials and whatnot online. So let me play with, let me turn the processing off and we're gonna to listen to a few bars. Now let me turn it back on. There's a big, big, big difference there. Um, so it's three things. <laughs> it's it's going to be three things. Um, the first is really going to be EQ. Um, so I'm using Slate digital bundle here, and we can ignore this and we can ignore this. And for now, we'll ignore this. This EQ right here is doing a ton to this sound. Um, so let's turn this off. So Look what's getting boosted here. This is 3.27 dBs up at 12.1 kilohertz. This is really, really high. But you're gonna see this a lot with strings that in the recordings, um, there's just something about giving a little bit of a boost up in the high end that just gives it this sizzle and this sparkle, which just really, really brings the strings to life. Um, there's also, I've got a tiny, tiny cut here in some of the hot, in, in some of the like high mids. Um, that are get, that was causing just a little bit of mud. Same thing down at about 800 or so hertz, just playing around with. What I tend to do here is just boost up the, the gain really, really high for parts where I wanna add some clarity by cutting and then find where it sounds most wonky and then go back and just take a little bit out. Um, there is also a, uh, a filter here for 30 hertz. Um, just to cut out the extreme, extreme mud of the down low. But an EQ, which is set up, it doesn't have to be exactly like this. Like, please use your ear and just play around with what sounds good. But an EQ, which sounds, or, or set up something like this on um, your, your bus is going to give the string sections almost always a ton of, ton of, ton of light. Now I'm also using, because I have the Slate Digital Bundle, I am using uh, their Air EQ just to give it even a little bit more sizzle and sparkle. Um, so I don't, I actually don't know exactly 
what other plugin I could recommend that replicates this sound. It is just giving it more boost to the high end, but if you own the Slate Digital Bundle, um, play around with adding a little bit of air to some of your orchestral samples. I think it gives it a lot, of, a lot of life. So let me turn this off and on. That one's a little bit more subtle. If I, what are we at? We're at, you're, we're at a little over a dB here, right? But that's that's almost nothing, but it's still, if you're listening with headphones or studio monitors, um, I think you can hear a pretty big difference there. Now, the next thing I'm adding is reverb. Um, and I'm not adding that much of it. You can look where the dry wet is. I'm using the score stage preset from Cinematic Rooms Professional. This is, an expe this is a really expensive reverb. Um, I am super passionate about orchestral music. This is like, whenever I have free time, this is what I do. So the point of this video and all the videos in this channel, and I'll say this over and over again, is not to go tell people to buy things. I'm just, I'm trying to show in my experience to other people who are as crazy, wacky, obsessed with this as I am, that that, that w genuinely want to spend their money this way and really are very confident that this is how they want to spend their money. If, of course, they're fortunate enough to be in a position where they have the money to buy these kinds of things. I know so, so, so many people aren't, and I wish things were cheaper. Um, but I'm just trying to show without any fluff, um, like what I've learned over the years of doing this that has given me the best possible sound. And a lot of the times it is just the case that the thing that gives you the best quality sound not always, certainly not always, but a lot of the time it think, it tends to be things which are more expensive. And this reverb to me is just compared to like the reverbs in Ableton Live um, or even something like Valhalla Vintage Verb or, or Valhalla Room um, or whatever the other one is, Valhalla Hall or whatever it's called, um, just makes a world of difference. It, it sounds to me like a, it's an algorithmic reverb, but it sounds to me like a beautiful, beautiful convolution reverb. It really does sound like you're really, really putting this in the room um, in a very musical way. But as tempting as it is to overload this with reverb, you lose so, so much clarity. And so one of the things I've had to learn the hard way, and it stinks, particularly when you've just got one patch open, because when you've just got one patch open, it can sound really, really good to crank that reverb way the heck up. But once you start adding multiple patches, it's just going to turn into a muddy wash of nonsense. So really, the, the, the purpose of this reverb is as much as I want to, to load it up with reverb and give it a beautiful tail and just wash it in this room is to take two different sample libraries which were recorded in two different places. Um, I actually don't know that, but I'm pretty confident that those two libraries were recorded in different places. It would be kind of odd if they were recorded in the same, in the same place. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure CSS was recorded not where Spitfire does their recordings. Anyways, I'll, 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 put a, I'll, I'll put something on the screen to confirm that. But it's to put sample libraries which were recorded in different places semi sounding like they're in the same room. Is it going to sound anything like what it would actually sound like to record live players playing in the same room? No, but it's close enough. And to my wacky ear who does this every single day, I can hear that this is not live players in a real room. But another thing to remember is that if you're really into this and you do this all the time, the level of ear training that you get is really, really, really crazy. Um, and it's not anything like special about me or you or anyone else. It's just, we do this all the time. And to 99% of ears, this just sounds like a real orchestra. And they're not gonna tell that there's two different sample libraries playing in two different rooms. Um, this is really just for us, <laughs> us nut jobs, um, who, 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 who wanna get something which sounds as close to live players as possible. Um, so that's what this is doing. If I turn it off and on, Honestly, I think you're barely even going to be able to hear a difference, but but I'll do it. I think you can hear it particularly as the um as the diminuendo is happening um and you can hear the reverb sort of take off. It 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 gives it a little bit more roomy sound um, that just helps put the two sample libraries, like I said, in the same room. Um, but it's nothing overwhelming. Now, there are cases where I will bump this up more, but really where the cinematic rooms comes into play for me, and I, 
there's no reverb out there, which sounds anything like, again, putting live players in a real room. But once you start to layer multiple, multiple different patches, um, it is where adding a little bit of cinematic rooms to each patch for me, really, that's where it stands out the most. Is it just the sense of continuity and actually feeling a little bit like things are in the same place um, helps a lot. But the other thing I've added here is just, this is epic music, right? This is not, the, the point of adding effects here is not just to get it to sound realistic. It's also to get it to sound good. Can you add OTT to real players in real time? No. Um, but adding a little bit of OTT to music that's meant to be epic is cool. It's fun. Um, incredibly easy to overdo, as is the case with anything that sounds really good. But I'll, I'll, I'll flip this back and forth off and on. But you can see even I've got, this is one patch right this is one ensemble patch um is my computer about to die Let me... this is one ensemble patch and i've got it at 11 percent when i've got multiple multiple patches open i'll even sometimes turn this way down on the bus sometimes you'll see a string bus that i have ott on it like two percent or three percent but it it adds something there's just no doubt to it it adds a, it adds a sizzle and, a, and an intensity so let me flip this off and on To me, it makes things sound more clear whilst also giving it depth and bite, which is awesome. I mean, OCT is, I know it's like overdone and it's too easy. And so people get all mad and people get mad at me for not using the Ableton OTT. Um, but like, if something sounds really good and is really easy to use, like just don't feel bad about using it and don't feel like you need to justify it to anyone. Um, just go ahead and use it. Now, the only thing I will add sometimes, which is not original to me and you know, earlier here, here I am sounding like I'm poo-pooing on Valhalla. Valhalla is beautiful. It just doesn't sound like you're putting something in a real room. It, it, like it sounds like the beautiful part of electronic reverbs um, where you can just create these sounds, which are just gorgeous. So let me just quickly throw on something, which I like. To, I like to use this dirty hall, maybe turn down the decay a little bit, bass multiplier down. I like to turn the attack way the heck up. Um, whatever, that's good enough. Um, if we have this just at like 40%, you can hear that this is this is crazy over the top. But this is just giving the idea of this synthetic reverb, which is really, really gorgeous. So what there you can hear that tail, right? That tail is gorgeous, right? When I pause it there. So what I tend to do is uh, sometimes I'll maybe put this down at somewhere around a 10 to 12 percent, something like that. Um, just to give it a little bit more extra tail at the end, but I didn't have that on in this case. That's just another additional thing. The final thing I wanted to touch on is I know that when you're learning to compose in your DAW, there's a lot of talk. Some people will say you have to play in your piece live. You know, you have to play it in and others, uh, you hear different things. I am of the opinion after having done this for a couple of years now, um, and having been producing in Ableton for, for longer than that. But having done the orchestral stuff for like four years now, um, I am of the opinion that in order to get something which sounds realistic, that one of two things must be played in live. Either you got to play it in the, the notes, which for many pieces, I'm practicing piano, um, but I'm still somewhere between beginner and intermediate. A lot of these are just too hard for me to play in. And I can play them in, um, but a lot of time it doesn't sound like the actual like niceness of playing something in live like a good piano player does. It doesn't really give it that human element. It just sounds like someone who's bad at piano. So a lot of times I don't. And particularly with ensemble patches, I don't. Um, these are layering. These are backbone. I like to have these be dead on the beat. And then if I'm going to play in another part, maybe play in a legato part live on top of it um, and have this really keeping things in time. So... The, but the part that I do have started to like pretty religiously do live is to not draw in mod wheel data or expression data or vibrato data is to record it all. Now, one day, hopefully I'll get there where I can record both mod and expression or even mod expression and vibrato all at once. That in and of itself, in my opinion, like you watch people on YouTube and they make it look so damn easy. I think it's really, really hard. 
um, learning to move it for someone who's never played a string instrument or any orchestral instrument, like learning to move with how the instrument would kind of naturally be played is really, really hard. So I'm still at the stage after four years of doing this um, where I, and I know that this is time consuming, but I record my mod wheel. Then I go back and I record my expression. Then I go back and I record my vibrato. I do think that recording at least one of the two elements, either playing it in live or your, your mod wheel data does give it an extra layer of life that just drawing in everything on its own tends to sound a little bit more robotic. Now, if you're a really skilled piano player and you can do both, phenomenal. Um, but I would recommend, just my recommendation, I know everyone has a different opinion. Um, and then the last, 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 last thing that isn't necessarily about epic Hollywood strings, but pay attention to your track delays. I don't have any track delay on right now because this is just one patch and it doesn't matter. Um, but track delays matter. I'll leave a link down in the description to a free public Google spreadsheet, um, which has a lot of very commonly sample li used sample libraries and their track delays. When you're layering your libraries and the different articulations, if things don't have the proper track delay, they're going to sound massively out of time, massively out of time. And you might have a beautiful piece that just sounds like doo-doo because it's not in time. So track delay is another thing to pay attention to. So I've talked about a bajillion different things. Maybe I should make a video going super in depth on each one of these. Um, but in my opinion, in my experience of trying to learn how to do the epic Hollywood orchestral cinematic string thing. Um, these are the pieces which all come together, all the little tips and secrets which come together to give it an epic Hollywood sound. It starts with composition, it starts with modal mixture, getting past just using major and minor, getting into some Dorian, some Lydian, and mixing back and forth. Um, and getting a little bit comfortable with using some notes outside of your major and minor keys. It also is about chord voicings and counter melodies. Another thing which I think you can learn from watching tutorials and taking lessons, I also think, in my opinion, the best place to learn counter lines is to study film music you like and game music you like and look in the piano roll or look at sheet music if you're more comfortable with that. Like, see how they do it because I think that you'll see that there's a lot of... If you start to if you if you actually want to put in the time, you'll notice that counter melodies are very strategic and there's not much that's random about them. The way they play with the main melody and with the bass line is very, very intentional. And this sort of melody moves, counter line steady. Melody stays constant, counter line moves. Um, it, you see it all over the place. And all of a sudden it begins to seem like something that's not this crazy, just like some people have the feel and some people don't, you'll notice that there are a lot of patterns you can learn. So harmony, chord voicings, modal mixture, composition, something which in and of itself I can talk about as much as I want. Um, but this is more so than anything, just giving you ideas of things if you're, if you're new um, to orchestral string writing, giving you some ideas of things to spend some time learning about because they are part of, they are all different ingredients which come together to give the epic sound. The next thing is about sample libraries and paying attention to which sample libraries you're using, which sample libraries you're layering. If a sample library you're thinking of purchasing offers a demo, please, dear God, use the demo before you actually buy something. Um, do your research before you buy things. But when you have made purchases, try and layer sample libraries strategically. Don't be afraid to buy sample libraries that a lot of people use and own because chances are that they sound really good. Um, play around with mic positions. Don't just leave everything in the default mix. Um, play around with mic positions as you can. Um, and then there's going to be a little bit of processing is going to probably make a big, big difference. All of these things come together to make epic Hollywood strings. I know there's one, there's no one big secret, which we're all looking for. Um, Sometimes, you know, the first time I remember learning about chromatic medians and hearing the sort of like... sort of thing i was like oh my god like <laughs> i found it right i found it hollywood here i come um but it's it's a lot of these little things that come together now i know this is gonna be a super long video um i hope that some people who are super super interested in this in the way that i am have found it and maybe thought about sticking through the whole thing i know not everyone's gonna want to watch this whole thing this is not Super well edited. Um, I'll get there. I'm in the middle of a move, so my editing time is very limited. Um, 
and, but I will get there over the summer. The video is going to be a little bit more edited and hopefully easier to follow. But this is for anybody who's a beginner to this, to the sample library string thing who really wants to do it. These are a lot of the things that I've learned to focus on over the years. And so with all that being said, I know this is a super long video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have a good one.